Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So be careful how you live your life, how you're walking out your life. Making the best use of your time, for the days are evil. Therefore, because of that, because we only have so much time, you're going to die someday, and so you have a short amount of time. Therefore, because of that, do not be foolish. But understand what the will of the Lord is. So let me help you. Someone, I get people ask me all the time, what's the will of God for my life? I can tell you. Right here. <laughs> Who knew? What's the will of God for my life, God? Here's part of it. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So this doesn't say get filled with spirits <laughs> from the liquor store. This isn't spirits, plural in a little schnapps bottle or whatever. This is spirit, singular, with the, with the article the. So you do stupid stuff when you're drunk. So the idea being, don't be stupid. Be filled with the spirit of God, and you'll always make the right choices. That's the beginning of, of uh, God's will for your life. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So this is what we did this morning. It's the reason you come to church. Could you sing at home in the shower to God? Sure you could. Could you read the Bible on your own? You understand English. You could read it at home with Lucky Charms or whatever. Money. Of course you could. But the point is there's something different about being together. There's something different about this moment than sitting in your car listening to the Bible on the radio. The reason it's different is because in synergy of people that love God, you sense the Spirit of God. Can you sense the Spirit of God alone by yourself on a mountain or fishing? Of course you can. God's everywhere. But there's something different about corporate connection with God. We sing together. You sense the Spirit of God. I'm teaching you God's Word. You sense being fed and filled by the Spirit of God. It's different. We're built to be together. Giving thanks always and for everything in God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go, ready? Here, here's relationships. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There couldn't be a more repulsive idea in our culture than submission. You couldn't ask for a more, a thing that stirs up immediate defense than the idea of submission. We don't want to submit to cops. We don't want to submit to uh, the government. We don't want to submit to our pastor. We don't want to submit to our family or our friends. We don't want to submit to our parents. We don't submit to anybody because we're a culture of rebellion. In fact, in our culture, it's gotten so bad that if somebody disagrees with you, you immediately uh, think they hate you. Oh, you don't like chocolate ice cream? You hate me, hater. <laughs> no, I just, I just don't like chocolate ice cream. You hate me. I don't hate you at all. What are you talking about? Our culture has built a culture of, of self-protection where I can hide in my rebellion by saying, oh, you hate me. So now I can say, because you're a hater, I don't have to listen to you. So what we've done is we built autonomy around individuals. And here's the problem with that. Anytime you have a culture where everybody's just autonomous, you can't say anything into my life, uh, I can't say anything into your life, everybody just live their own way, you, you automatically have a culture that's going to come apart. Unless you have a culture of submission, you have a culture of rebellion. And that's a culture that we're heading to. That's why our culture is ripping apart at the seams. Because we hate submission. Now, there's a good way of submission and there's a bad way. We're going to talk about God's version right now. Verse 22, here we go. Here's the family unit. Ready? I'm going to tell you why your marriage doesn't work. I'm going to break it apart right now. Or if you are single and you're like, man, my parents' marriage was a mess. I'm going to help you. I'm going to tell you why it was. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. So right here, understand this isn't saying, oh, women aren't smart enough, or this is some like egalitarian, uh, old, uh, male-dominated uh, idea. Understand this. Scripture says you are to submit to only your, only your husband. It's not sexism to say there has to be order in your home. It doesn't say all women submit to every man. 
So sometimes this is stereotyped into saying, oh, this is like uh, putting down women. It actually isn't. What this is talking about is order in your home. You, you don't want chaos in your home? Follow this. You want chaos? Keep doing what you're doing. This isn't saying a whole society has to say uh, women are submissive to men. Nope. It says be submissive to your own husband. This is talking about a marital relationship, not a society of sexes. Everybody with me? So this isn't saying women are second class. It's saying same class, different role. Equal, but different role. Our society says there shouldn't be any different roles because we want everybody to be the same. But the problem is nobody's the same and we can't figure out why our society doesn't work. Because we're different, but we're equal. So inside of marriage, wives submit to your husbands. We're going to look at what that, at what that means. Now as the church submits to Christ, which the church should always submit to Christ, so their wives should submit to everything uh, to their husbands. So wives, submit to your husbands. And number, uh, verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So husbands, guess what your role is? To love your wife unconditionally and to give your life for your wife. You're not the head as a dictator. You're the head as a guy who will lay his life down for his family. It's a different way of thinking of headship. Headship isn't, isn't brutality. Headship is submission to your wife's needs, to what your family needs. You lead by loving. It's a different, most of us have never even heard of a, of a family that works this way, but this is God's design for the home. It's the reason maybe your family doesn't work very well. Your marriage doesn't work very well. You're like, why doesn't this work? We loved each other like 48 years ago. Why doesn't this work? Because 48 years ago, you might have had a wrong view of marriage. It may have lasted for 48 years, so let me fix it today. Verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way. So in the same way that Jesus gave his life for the church, me and you, that we might be clean and pure and, and, and holy and satisfied in who we are, in that same way husbands should love their wives, underline it, Husbands in here, underline verse 28. In the same way that Jesus loves the church, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So we got the beautiful picture of intercourse here, which we'll look at next week. Actually, we won't look at intercourse. We'll talk about intercourse. <laughs> I'm not going to get your hopes up. It's not going to be like that. We're going to talk about the oneness between a husband and wife next week. But today we talk about roles. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and to the church. However, let each one of you uh, love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Underline verse 33, because that boom shakalaka is Marriage distilled down to one verse. Guess what? You don't need a book. You don't need to go to a marriage seminar. You don't need some counseling on what to do. Are all those things good? Yep. You should go to a counselor. You should read a book. But you want to know how, how your marriage does or doesn't work? It's in, verse 30, it's in verse 33. You want to know if your marriage works or not? Is a husband loving his wife as he loves himself? Because men love themselves a whole lot. So man, can you imagine loving your wife like you love yourself? Like looking out for her more than you even look out for your own flesh? And does a wife respect her husband? Is there a lot of chaos? Is there a lot of put downs? Is there a lot of yelling and screaming? And uh, is there a lot of battling going on in the house? Or is there harmony? Men, love your wives. Love them more than you even love yourself. Wives, respect your husband. Because men live off respect. Men live off respect and die with disrespect. Men will avoid disrespect. If they're, di they're disrespected at work, they'll look for another job. Disrespected at home, they'll look for another home. Men will put up with a lot, but men don't put up with disrespect. Women will put up with a lot, but they, but they won't put up with not feeling loved for a long time. Women need to sense love. They need to sense connection. They need to sense, sense depth of relationship.
Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Praise God. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome if that was true? <laughs> For this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger when you discipline them, but bring them up in the dis discipline and instruction of the Lord. Wow. Ready? Here we go. I'm going to pull apart marriage today with the idea that I want your marriage to be awesome. I want you to walk out of here going, okay, I see the roadmap of how my marriage can be awesome. Or if you're single, go, okay, now I get why mom and dad's marriage is a total train wreck or it was totally awesome. And how my, how my marriage can be awesome maybe sometime in the future. Ready? Here we go. Number one, God made marriage. God made marriage. So let me help you with this. California doesn't vote on what marriage is. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter what we vote on. Uh, California might vote five guys can get married. Or 28 people and a shoe can get married to each other. Or a horse and a, ca and a camel and 15 people plus a, a, a broom. It doesn't even matter what people think marriage should be. It only matters what God thinks marriage is. So just because you have a piece of paper that says you're married and have a ring doesn't mean you're married in front of God. Because God decides what marriage is and he decides what a legitimate marriage should be. And here's the reason I say that. Think about it this way. I've been to a lot of cultures. Some of them in the middle of the jungle. I've been to hyper-modern cultures like ours. Guess what? Every culture has a version of marriage. Why is that? Nobody had to train them that a man and a woman should be together. Now, everybody does marriage differently as far as culturally what happens in marriage, but isn't it odd that every culture has a version of marriage? You know what that means? That means that God built marriage inside of men and women. That means that we seek out marriage whether we're in the middle of the jungle as tribes or we're in the middle of L.A., which is kind of jungle and tribes as well. <laughs> if you've ever dealt with gangs, uh, that's true. So understand this. Marriage isn't people's idea. It's already, uh, it's already above us. It's, it's been given to us by God. It's in us. The idea is, is, is over us as a society. We get married. We just got to figure out what is marriage. God made marriage. That's the reason we do it. That's the reason every culture does it. The home was originally designed to be relationships of harmony. Woo! You ever heard bad singers? So it's like you go to a, you go to a, a concert or you go to your daughter's eighth grade uh, concert recital or whatever and your daughter's an awesome singer and you see, or your granddaughter. She's, she's getting up to sing her solo. La. But all of a sudden, the people who are supposed to be harmonizing with her, the other eighth graders or whatever, they're like, ha, 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 ha. And you're like, oh gosh, please just stop. Even though, you're, even though your daughter's doing awesome, the discordant and disharmony just goes, okay, stop. I want everybody to stop. Even the person that's doing the right thing. Just stop. Everybody stop. This is the worst thing I've ever heard. Your ears go, no, 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 no. <laughs> and it's the same thing with relationships. The reason, if you're in your marriage and you're going, no, 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 this just doesn't work. I don't feel love or I don't feel respected. Maybe I need another relationship. Let me help you with that. Those of us that are serial divorcers, Let me help you. The reason you have relationship problems with your second, third, fourth, fifth wife, husband, is because it's the same problems, just a different face. Because the issue isn't the other person, the issue is you. So marriage brings out the best in us and brings out the worst in us. So marriage is designed by God to do something. Just because you've got a ring and you stand before a pastor doesn't mean marriage just works out. It means that there's work for you to do. Marriage is difficult for a reason, and we're going to look at that right now. When God created Adam, he built him with needs that were only met by another person. At the first wedding in Eden, God presented Adam with a wife. So I want you to turn to the first book of your Bible. Turn way to the front to Genesis. It's right after your cover and table of contents. Genesis chapter 2, ready? Here's how we know God came up with marriage and not uh, the state of California or the United States or some other place. Because it's an institution built by God, not by people. People can vote on whatever they want, but it doesn't mean that God uh, respects that decision. Genesis 2, 
Verses 18. Oh, this might blow your mind. Ready? Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. So God has built Adam out of the dust as a human being. I will make a helper suitable or fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was found no helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs or his side, and he closed up the place with flesh. So God performs a first surgery while Adam's sleeping. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, so he fashions Eve out of Adam's DNA and brought her to the man. Right here we see the first wedding. Dad, God the Father, brings his daughter, who he built, to the man he built. And in the garden, God presides over the first wedding between a man and a woman. Verse 23, Then the man said, At last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, because men and women are built to be together, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. It's the idea of uh, sexual connection, uh, relational connection, family connection. And they shall become one flesh and the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. So at the first wedding, everybody's naked. Now that's a wedding. <laughs> no, it's just three people. It's God and Adam and Eve, but it's still a wedding. So I want you to see this. Ready? Women, watch. Watch this so beautiful. It's going to help you. Men and women are equal but different in role. So men have masculinity. Women have femininity. It's a descriptor of who you are, but it, there is no second-class citizen. Women are not second-class. Women are same-class, different role. Which is why in your marriage, if you think all roles are equal, you go to battle all the time and you go, this is the worst marriage ever. Why, is this, why does my marriage just absolutely torture? I'll tell you why. Because you are equal in value to God because he built you, but you are different in role. So think of a team, football team. Volleyball team. Everybody has a different position to play, but everybody's equal. Everybody's equal as humans out in the court or out in the field, but not everybody's a quarterback. Not everybody's the setter. Not everybody's, not everybody gets to play every position. But when everybody plays their position, the team is in harmony. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's like listening to a choir where everybody's singing in harmony. It's beautiful to listen to. When everybody goes, I'm going to sing whatever I want. Nah! Everybody goes, what are you doing? You're destroying this team. Are you destroying this, this concert because you want to do your own thing? And that's exactly the way it is with marriage. When you think it's just about what I want to do, you've already slid down the path to going, I'm destroying this marriage because I, I'm not choosing the, my mate, I'm choosing myself. The first family shared a common God, a common DNA. Imagine Adam looking at his wife She's built out of his DNA. Think about how close she looked to Adam in looks. Probably, it's probably him with long hair. Go, whoa, it's a female me. Now, that's, that's, that's some close living. There's no doubt about who's related to who. I mean, they both look at each other and go, whoa. You just got different equipment than I do, but we're pretty similar. <laughs> we're equal, but we have different roles. Nobody's second class to anyone. But you've got to have a different part to play if you want harmony. You want harmony in your home? You're going to have to play a different part. Harmony is just as valuable as the melody. But they've got to do their part for it to sound good. This first family shared a common God, common DNA, and a desire to meet each other's unique needs. God built men and women to live together, love together, and last together in harmony. Guess what? Your marriage is built to die on. When you stood before me or some pastor or some guy out on the you know, golf course or the beach or wherever you got married, if you're married, you, you made a covenant between that guy, the guy that officiated, and God and the people who are gathered there. You made a covenant. I'm going to die before I leave this person. It's, it's the heaviest commitment other than to Jesus you'll ever make with a person. 
I'm going to die before you and I are ever separated. That's the heaviest thing you could ever say. That's what a marriage is. Marriage isn't, oh, we're not working out. Oh, you burned the toast. I'm out. (laughs) Marriage is saying, no matter what, I'm going to die with you. Marriage is a mirror and a molder. You want to know why marriage is, marriage is hard? Guess what? Marriage is a mirror to yourself. You want to know why you got problems in your marriage? Don't point at the other person. Point at yourself. Because marriage is a mirror to show you where you need to work. There's nothing that, that shows you your own flaws like a mate. Marriage is an immediate mirror. Why can't you just do that? Why can't you just, what, what's your problem? What's your deal? Why can't you, why, why? and you just realize, dude, why am I like getting so crazy about this stuff? What's wrong with me? Like, why am, am I cr- going nuts? Why do I keep hacking at him? Why do I keep tearing him down? Why do, I, why do I make a big deal out of things that aren't even a big deal? Why can't I love my wife? Gosh, I remember when he first got together with her, I just, I, I, things were natural. Now things are unnatural. And here's the deal. Marriage will show you your selfishness. God has built marriage to mirror your selfishness. So don't keep poking. When you poke at the person, you're actually pointing yourself in the mirror. Because you'd be amazed how if you changed, your whole marriage would change. Rather than going, oh, if he would just stop doing that, leaving his socks right there. How many times have I told him for 50 years? He always leaves his socks on the stairs. Which I may have done a couple times myself, which isn't bad. Gosh, if she would just stop nagging me about the thing, or if she would stop doing this, if she would, she would, she would, hey, you know what, at the end of the day, you need to look at yourself in the mirror and go, how do I need to change? Because marriage is a mirror to show you where your character flaws are. And you know the best way to show you is God puts somebody so intimately involved in you, he or she knows you better than anyone else on this earth. Your faults, your failures, your character issues, all those issues, man, your wife knows because she lives with you. Your husband knows because he's with you. So God builds the deepest relationship, builds them to be together, so it shows you, you go, I need to change. Marriage is a mirror and a molder. We don't want to live in tension, which is why we get divorced. We go, this marriage is over, I'm out. Because we can't live in tension. We can't live in that disharmony. It's just that that piercing, like, dude, why can't you guys sing together? That, That feeling where you go, turn that down. Gosh, it sounds horrible. Because we're not built for that, we go, I'm getting divorced, I'm out. Rather than saying, I'm in this for the long haul, how do I need to change to become what God built me to be in my marriage? Because then you'll start hearing harmony where there once was just discord. Because it molds you to be what you should be. That, that pressure shouldn't drive you apart to divorce. That pressure should drive you to change so that there's harmony. Everybody with me? Mirrors a molder, uh, it, it mirrors you and it molds you. That's, what, that's the idea of marriage. And it's for this reason. Marriage wasn't made to make you primarily happy, but primarily holy. Holy cow. Really, pastor? Yep. You want to know why your marriage is hard? Because it's not primarily made to make you happy. Now, are there happy days in your marriage? Absolutely. You go party together. You get a room at the, you know, Bellagio or whatever. You go hang out. As you're, you're with your best friend. You get to have sex together, you get to have kids together, you get to spend money together, you get to buy nice things for one another. Marriage has its days where it's the best thing ever. But then five minutes later, it's like, what? (laughs) Why am I with you? It's like those Disney movies, right? So Disney has ripped off generations of young ladies. It has trained them to be like, he's going to come rescue you. And the, the knight in shining armor... And it's beautiful. You know what's beautiful? Is he rescues her and she feels secure and awesome. He's going to take care of her. This is going to be sweet. He is going to let her be everything that she's supposed to be. The only problem is it doesn't show you six months down the road when they're living together fighting about who didn't do the dishes and why the kid's screaming and who should pick up the kids from, from ballet. The problem is a Disney movie stops at romance and perfection It doesn't show you the year later when they're screaming at each other and I'm going to get divorced. I hate you. Why did I marry you? It doesn't show you that. You know why? I don't know why. Because marriage is tough. Are there good times? Absolutely. Are there difficult times? Yep. Do they have a purpose? Yes. To show you where you need to work and your flaws and to become the man or woman of God God's built you to be. That's why marriage is hard. 
It's not primarily made to make you happy. If you're waiting for marriage to make you happy, you're, you're looking in the wrong place. We looked at this last week. You want to know where happiness is found? In serving Jesus. If you're, if you're waiting for your mate to make you happy, you're looking in the wrong place. You'll continually be disappointed because he or she can never make you happy long term. You know who can make you happy long term? Is the joy of serving Jesus. The relationship that can only be filled by God, don't expect a person to fill that spot. God reserves space for himself in your heart. And until that's filled by him, you'll always be looking for someone to make you happy. That's even how Match.com sells themselves. Do you want to be happy? Find your soulmate. What a load of crap. <laughs> you know, the reason you even if you find somebody on there, you know the reason a lot of those things don't happen, even if you fill out your little you know, form or whatever, is because at the end of the day, it's about commitment, not about how you feel. Are we going to die together or not? That's what it comes down to in marriage. Is there going to be tough times? Absolutely. But the... the the issue isn't is there going to be hard times, is are we going to get through them together or not? That's the issue. Because marriage is designed to make you holy, more like Jesus, less like yourself than happy. It's why marriage is hard, but it's not impossible. So now let's look at the roles. Who designed marriage? God designed marriage. Now let's look at the roles in marriage. God made husbands, <laughs> for good and for bad. God made husbands. So you may be thinking, what do you mean God made husbands? Let me help you with that. Our society teaches young men this. Hey, you know what? When you get married, you're just a single guy with a ring. <laughs> you know what? Don't tell your wife, don't let your wife tell you to do that, man. You want to go out with the bros, go to Vegas? Dude, let's do this thing. Man, oh, you can, oh, you're going to let your wife tell you to stay home and do that? Oh, do, oh you got to mow the lawn or whatever? Bro, come on, man. Dude, life's too short. We're going to go. We're going to get together. We're going to get the gang back together, man. Let's go. We're going to do video games. Remember like we used to do in your mom's basement? Dude, we're going to have a bro weekend. Okay. Nothing wrong with having friends outside of your marriage. But understand this. Being a single guy is not being a husband. When you were a single guy, no responsibility. You do what you want. You spend what you want on whatever you want. We, talked, we looked at that last week in dating. Hey, God doesn't call you to marriage? Awesome. Go spend your energy and your money on Jesus. Serve Jesus to the best of your ability. But if God calls you to be married, guess what? Being a husband's different than being a single guy. What does it mean to be a husband? Let's look at that role. In creating Adam, God set a standard for masculinity in men. As a husband, his position is head and leader of the family. This is not a dictatorial or an abusive leadership but rather self-sacrificial, the kind Jesus exemplifies for the church. So understand this. Head does not mean ruler. It doesn't mean dictator. What it means is somebody's got to take responsibility, and God puts that on the man. Somebody's got to be the guy that goes out and makes the money to make sure the home can happen. Now, can women have jobs and blah, blah, blah? You, you might be the smartest person in your family, ladies. You, can, you might make more money. Julie had higher education than I did and made more money than, than I did almost until uh, years into our marriage. So this isn't a women can't do nothing. Women, if it wasn't for Julie, we would have starved to death at the beginning of our marriage. But understand this. God got a hold of my heart and said, hey, you need to lead this family. And I didn't even know what that was when I was there because I'd never even heard of that. And so what it came upon me was, hey, you go out, do the best you can to make a living because the responsibility is on you, not on your wife. You are the leader of this home. And you know what that means for a man? That means you sacrificially give your life for your wife. You lay down your life for your wife. You give your best energy, not to your bros, not even to work. You give your best energy to your wife. Now, some of that energy has to go into making a living and, and keeping the family afloat. But understand, the reason you do those things is because you love your wife. Not even because you love yourself. You want to love your wife like Jesus loves the church. That means he gave his life for us. Gentlemen, you want to be respected by your wife? It's amazing how women are respecting, are respective of their husbands when they know their husband does everything they can to love their wife. Because women are built responders. Women are built to respond. Which is why when a woman doesn't feel like she is, is cared for, she goes into defense mode. 
She goes, I'm putting the walls up and I got to protect myself. I have to get my own money and get my own job and get my own friends. Now I got I to gotta, I gotta protect myself. And women go into this steel trap. Nobody touches me. I'm not going to get hurt again mode. But that's not where women find their value. Women don't find their value in being hard and against everything. Women find their value in like, does anybody love me? Does anybody appreciate me? And all of a sudden, women are built to be soft. Women are built to be responsive. That's not weak. That's saying, I'm not built to go and be against everything. I am built to help things. I'm built to be a helper. I find my value in having deep relationships, not going to war against everything. Men are built to lead, not dictate, but to say, how can I serve my wife? It's a different way than you've been taught leadership in college. Leadership in college is you tell everybody what to do. Hey, go do that thing. But leadership in the home is to say, sweetie, I want you to know I'm never leaving you. You know what your wife needs to hear from you? is is stability. Women operate oftentimes out of insecurity. Does anybody think I'm beautiful? Am I good enough? Sure. Thank you. (laughs) One person thinks so. Men tend not to deal with those things. Men tend to deal with, this is how I am, and this is, this is the life I'm going to build. And it's amazing how when, when men step into their role of loving leaders of their home, all of a sudden everybody falls in line and there's harmony because everybody plays their roles. Everybody's equal, but everybody now has a role to play in the harmony of the home or else everybody's just on their own singing their own tune and there's disharmony. The husband's primary role is to lead by loving and knowing his wife. He is to be the protector and provider for his family to the best of his ability. This doesn't mean, men, that, you know, if your wife's putting pressure on you, like, we got to get newer and better, newer, bigger, or whatever, and you feel like, gosh, I got to keep making money, I'm bigger, blah, blah, blah. Understand what God expects out of you. God expects you to just do the best you can with the physical and mental abilities you can. In other words, don't be lazy. God says, husbands, Lead your home by doing the best you can and find value in that. You know what's crazy about men is they literally give their lives for their family. Most of us will drop dead of a heart attack, guys, in here, sorry to tell you. And you know what happens from that? It's just testosterone just burns a hole in your heart as you start to get older. God has built you to be the leader. God has built you to literally give your life for your family, for building a home, for making finances, and also to protect your home. In other words, in my home, I, you know, if I hear something scary and bumping in the night, I, I don't go, Julie, there's something downstairs. <laughs> go down there and see what it is. I'll go get help <laughs> as I leave the window. No, right? So you understand by nature, men don't go, hey, go take care. You could have an MMA wife who could kick your butt, but the point is, is that Your role isn't to go, wife, go take care of that scary thing downstairs while I go get help. You go, you at least go along, fight alongside your wife. (laughs) I mean, if you read it in the paper, like, man leaves wife to die as he confronts, you know, burglar, but he survived. Nobody goes, "Ah, good job, awesome, good job. Nope. Gentlemen, you're the protector and the provider for your home to the best of your ability. That's your role. That's how God built masculinity. Not to, be, not to abuse, but to use your strength to bless. God made wives, number three. Who made marriage? God made marriage. Who made husbands? God made husbands. What's a husband supposed to do? Primarily protect and provide. Love his wife like he loves himself. You lay down your life for your wife. If you have to die protecting your wife, that's your job. If you have to die working 50 years to provide for your home and your family, that's your job. Go die and do that job and honor God. God made wives. What's the difference between a single lady, all the single ladies, and a wife? I'll tell you what the difference is between a wife and a single woman. God made Eve equal to Adam in value but different in role. Ladies, you are totally equal to your husband. He looks at you, the, God looks at you the exact same way. There's no difference in value at all. You might be smarter than your husband. You might be the best person in the whole home. 
but you have a different role to play. It doesn't matter, ladies, if you become the president of the United States. I hope you do. It doesn't bother me at all. But guess what? If you're married to a man and he becomes first husband or whatever of the United States because you're the president, awesome. Guess what? You're still to be his helper at home. This is the order of the home. You could be a corporate CEO, run the world. Who cares? You know what God cares about? God cares about the order of the church and the order of the home. I don't care if you're president of the United States, young ladies, but when you come home, you're, you're a helper to your husband. Doesn't mean you're second class. Doesn't mean you're not smarter. You might be the smartest person around, but your role is to help. Why is it to help? Because you don't want disharmony in your home. God made Eve equal to Adam in value, but different in role. As a woman and a wife, Eve's primary role was to be helper, nurturer, and homemaker. Ladies, here's the deal. You're the heart of the home. So for us single dads, we do our best, right? We put up pictures and we put away the pizza boxes when people are coming over or whatever. Like men do their best. But nobody can replace a woman's heart in the home. Because when you walk into a home, man, you feel that home. And the majority of that feeling comes from the wife. It feels like something. You know when you walk into a home, is this organized? Is, it, is there somebody love this home? You, you sense it. It could be a dirt hut or it could be a sweet place up in Beverly Hills. It doesn't matter. You sense if somebody loves that home. And that's, that's the woman's role. Like you're, you're the heart of that home. Nobody can replace you. No man can replace what you do for a home. And it doesn't even matter if you're a corporate CEO. Your home feels like something only because you, do, you make it feel that way. As a husband is to love his wife, the wife is to be submissive to his leadership. So let me give you a, a super practical example. After this service, you're going to talk to your wife about uh, where do you want to go to lunch. Ready? Here's how this works out in the real world. It's because this is what always happens with Julie and I. Hey, where do you want to go to lunch? And the guy will always say what? I don't care. Where do you want to go? Right? <laughs> now, in his mind, he's thinking, dude, I just want to go to In-N-Out and have a stinking burger. But I know my wife's eating some, like, green leafy stuff. And so I don't know where we can even get that. I don't really care, sweetie. You choose where we're going. I'll just eat wherever. Right? I'm just like, whatever. But here's the problem with that. Because you know, if a guy chooses something, you know, let's go to In-N-Out. The immediately wife goes, oh, no. <laughs> You know I'm on that diet thing. And then you feel stupid until so you're like, okay, let's just, I'm going to get around this, this fight and just go, I don't care where we go. Here's, here's how you fix that, ready? Unless it's, an, unless it's illegal or unbiblical, be supportive of your husband. Where do you want to go to, where do you want to go to lunch, sweetie? Let's go to In-N-Out. Baby, that's awesome. <laughs> I would love to follow your leadership, husband, because I love you. You know what's going to happen? Even in the stupidest example I just gave, you know what instantly happens to men? Because they sense that respect. All of a sudden they're like, yeah, we're going to In-N-Out, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Get in the van. Get in the van. <laughs> going to In-N-Out, man. <laughs> so here's the point I'm making. Men, men can't put up with disrespect and discord long before they just go, I'm out. I'm out emotionally. I'm out physically. You'll be amazed, ladies, when you're supportive, when you step into your role, can you decide where you go to dinner? Of course you can. Nobody's saying you can't decide where to go to dinner. Nobody's saying you can't speak into a situation. But the point is, don't go to battle over everything. Because then your husband goes, I'm out. I don't even care. Just do whatever. And what you don't want is a husband that checks out. How you keep that from happening is super simple. Is you just don't go to battle over everything. Where do you want to go? And husbands, don't say, I don't care anymore. Don't say, I don't care. Go, let's go to, let's go to uh, wherever. Now, your wife might go, eh, and you might have to change your mind. <laughs> now, listen, the husband's the head of the home, but the wife is the neck. <laughs> right? She, she, can, she, influences, she influences where the head goes. Right? So they're, they're both of equal value in deciding where the body goes. But next, don't always be fighting where the head's saying, let's go. Because it's not about you being smarter, having value, or even having your way. It's just about saying, let's have order, man. And you know what's going to make? It's going to transform your home. Here's my point. When you leave this place, I want you to transform your home. It's not hard. The things I'm saying are not hard, but they're difficult. They're super simple, but they're difficult. 
It's not hard to understand. You can do it, but it's just up to you if you want to do it. You could transform your marriage literally in a day if you started respecting your husband in front of the kids and the husband was like, I'm going to die for this family. When you, if you look at your, your wife in the eyes and go, guess what, sweetie? You want to know something? I'm never going to cheat on you. I'm never going to leave you. There will never be a day I lust after another woman because I love you. You can guarantee I'm going to go to my death loving you as my wife. I give my life for you. And all of a sudden, wives just soften. They go, okay, I don't have to be in defense mode anymore. Wow, he's going to take care of me. Not that I can't take care of myself. I can totally take care of myself. But to have peace in the home, we got to fit into our roles. I'm not a single woman with a, with a married band. I'm a wife. What does that mean? I have to fit into my role. Not because I'm less than, I'm equal to, but I'm different in role. And lastly, we look at the children. Oh, man. <laughs> Who made marriage? God made marriage. Not people, not California. Who made husbands? God made husbands. You're not a single guy with a band. Who made wives? God made wives. You're not a single woman happening to live in the same home with a guy. And lastly, God made children. Fathers are to bring up their children in godliness. By obeying instruction and discipline, children give honor to their parents and invite God's blessing. God never, and here's the point I want to bring out, God never blesses rebellion. God doesn't bless Wife, wife rebellion of role, disrespect, 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 disrespect. God doesn't bless unloving husbands to their, to their wives. Unloved, 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 unloved. God doesn't respect uh, or bless rebellion by children to their parents. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I disrespect you, I dishonor you in public, in the home. I hate everybody, I hate this family. I wanna get out of here. God will not bless your life until you become uh, a person of submission. Submission doesn't mean you're less than. In fact, you could be the stronger person is usually the one that submits. To say, I don't want chaos. I will submit to, to, to make this thing work. It's like a team. Everybody has to submit to the coach. Everybody has to submit to the play. We do submission all the time, but for some reason in the home, we feel like, I don't have to submit to anybody. But the, the home's the most important relationships there are. And we think that they can be a free-for-all. It's the reason our divorce rate's over 50%. We have one of the worst divorce rates in the history of the world. Why is that? Not because everybody just needs to get happy. Everybody needs to get Jesus. And once people get Jesus, they realize, what is a family about? Oh, now I see. Now I can work on it. By obeying instruction and discipline, children give honor to parents and invite God's blessing. Unless unbiblical or illegal, children are to obey everything that their parents tell them eventually blessing their parents back. I love 1 Timothy 5.4. It says, when you get older, children, pay back your parents. <laughs> I can't wait to that day. <laughs> Here we go. God has built men to lead and love, women to respect and respond, and children to obey. You want, to, you want your family to work good? You work on those three things. It's that easy. Respect and respond, ladies. Men, love and lead. Children, listen and obey. And then there's harmony. And then you've got a marriage that the kids go, wow, mom and dad, they got an awesome marriage. Because here's the reality, ready? Listen, I close. W young ladies in the home, when they see mom respecting dad, they go, oh, okay. That's how a, a woman in a home is supposed to respond to dad, even if he's difficult. Okay, now I get it. Young women, when they see dad, love, love mom, and they go, wow, dad's loving mom even when she's difficult. That's, that's pretty awesome. Dad goes to work every day to make sure I got clothes on, these lights stay on, and mom gets fed. Man, that's awesome. Thanks, dad. I, now, so now, now young women will choose their dad as a mate. Ready? You get trained for 20 years on how the most intimate relationships work in the home. So oftentimes, ladies will choose their dad in what they see in a mate. Young men in the home, they look at mom and they go, wow, look at how mom respects dad. That's awesome. Even when she doesn't agree sometimes, she still respects dad. That's sweet. I love how my mom does that. Now young men look at their dad and they go, oh, that's how you treat a woman. You don't punch her. You don't intimidate her. You don't take advantage of her. You don't, you know, you don't leave when things are bad. You don't bail on our family. Wow, you're still here. Awesome, dad. So now young men go, okay, that's the kind of man I want to be. And, and now they look at mom and they go, okay, now that's the kind of woman I want to choose. And so now they'll find a wife pretty much like their dad chose. 
And so they find a wife like mom. Because why? Because I've been trained now as a young man for 20 years, from zero to 20, I've been trained in how to be in a marriage. So if it's totally dysfunctional and discord and mom's fighting and dad's fighting, then I go, dude, maybe marriage doesn't work or blah, blah, blah. But if I see some harmony there, even when there's imperfection, I go, okay. Now that's how marriage should be. Okay, I can do that. Do marriage God's way. It's, it won't be perfect, but it'll be satisfying. You'll feel satisfied in your heart that you're pleasing God and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing as a man or woman of God. 